It all ends here. After nine weeks of episodes, Shogun finally reached its finale. But did it stick the landing? Well, I have a lot to say on that. Of course, this will just be my review for only episode 10. However, like I have said previously, I will be making a full series review soon as well to cover my thoughts on the show in its entirety. Yet, what did I think about the grand conclusion? Let's dive in and discuss. And as always, there will be spoilers ahead. Episode 10 is titled, A Dream of a Dream. The title of this episode is very symbolic for several reasons, one of which being the fact that there are a number of points in the episode that do show us a vision of Blackthorn's future, now being quite old and remembering the events of the series. However, another interesting connection actually goes to Toyotomi Hideyoshi, Japan's famous second great unifier who came to be known as the Taiko. It was a line within Hideyoshi's death poem that uttered the phrase which can be translated as all of Naniwa is dream within dream. Thus, the title of this episode, A Dream of a Dream, is very similar. After last week's brilliant episode, I was very hopeful for how they might conclude the series here. Yet, after all said and done, I'm not sure what my ultimate thoughts are on it just yet. There were certainly plenty of heartfelt moments that were really great, but behind everything were several major details or events that simply felt a bit disappointing, but were not completely unexpected. As I mentioned, the episode starts with a vision of the future, Blackthorn in old age. Now, it's not clear where he is, unless one of you eagle-eyed viewers were able to pick up on a detail like that. Perhaps he actually did make it home now and he's back in England, or maybe he is now over in Nagasaki in the Dutch trade port of Dejima. It's hard to say. I was told by someone who listened to the show's official podcast that apparently these moments may not actually be a vision of the future, but instead Blackthorn wondering where his life might end up. The visions show Blackthorn having become an old and weary man, still clinging to the memories of the several months he had spent with Mariko. We then cut forward to the regular timeline, where we are right there as Mariko's lifeless body is being held in Blackthorn's arms. Osaka and everyone in it is in a state of chaos after this attack. Ishido had only intended for Mariko to be captured, not killed. Yet, as we come to see later on, it was always Toranaga and Mariko's plan for her to die, completely shattering the council. We even learn that the Jesuits were in on it too, as Father Alvito explains to Blackthorn of the arrangement which had been made, one which spared his own life. And although we initially believed that this came at the price of losing his ship, we of course also come to later discover that yes, this was all orchestrated by Toranaga. What I was unhappy to see, though, is that the series also robbed us of what would have been an amazing final confrontation between Blackthorn and the rest of the Portuguese and Jesuits. As in the book and prior adaptation, they still all want Blackthorn dead, and there is a very climactic moment between all of the major European characters, where Blackthorn is only saved thanks to the intervention of Alvito, who remains true to his promise to Mariko to save Blackthorn's life. Instead, we don't see any of the other Portuguese and Jesuit characters in this episode, which is really quite a bummer because they have sort of been absent from much of the series as it is. This is most felt with the lack of Rodriguez, who is so much more of a major character in the other versions. But getting back to the council, like we saw, they are all in a bit of chaos following Mariko's death. Even Torinaga has had the time to send a message to Osaka protesting her death. Which makes me wonder how much time has passed, given that word had to not only reach Torinaga that she had died, but then also that he had time to send the message. Either way, Ishido is still set on going to war with Torinaga, now being that Mariko's death has meant that Torinaga is not coming to Osaka. And the rest of the council is still split on this, but in the end they do all decide still to go to war. But it is also here that we see how Ochiba, now after Mariko's death, is even more against Ishido, and as we will come to see, will also form a secret pact with Toranaga. Afterwards, Ishido pays a visit to Yabu, who has sort of gone mad, probably from all the guilt and stress. He has not completely lost his mind by any means, but he still is acting a bit more sporadic in his actions now. Both Yabu and Blackthorn are allowed to depart for Anjiro, and Yabu even asks Blackthorn if he can take him on his ship back to England. Yet, once they arrive in Anjiro, they see that Blackthorn's ship has been completely destroyed. And I like Blackthorn's reaction to this. While in the prior versions of the story, he had been enraged at seeing his ship destroyed, here he sort of just sighs like he knew this might happen all along. 
In Anjiro, there is a brutal crackdown by Toranaga going on to root out who the perpetrators are who destroyed Blackthorn's ship. Yet, like I mentioned, we later discover that it was all part of Toranaga's plan. Toranaga first meets with Yabu, who confesses his treachery and is given a sentence to commit seppuku. Yabu tries to ask for Blackthorn to be his second, another detail I really like. But Toranaga refuses, and ultimately, he will be the one to do it. With this, the Kashigi family will pass on to Omi. Blackthorn and Fujiko also share several touching moments throughout the episode as well, as she tells Blackthorn that Toranaga is allowing her to go off to become a nun. Blackthorn is sad to hear this, but in the end, he accepts it. He also helps to put to rest the remains of her husband and child, as Blackthorn rows her out to sea to dump the ashes into the water. It is here he also parts ways with Mariko's cross. I'm glad we got these final moments with Fujiko, because it would have been sad for the series to end without her being there as well especially now coming to treat Blackthorn in a more friendly manner, after all they've been through. And it is through Fujiko that Blackthorn asks her to write a letter for him, requesting to meet with Toranaga. It's here when leaving to see him, I love that Blackthorn just immediately gives his weapons to Omi like they are nothing, surprising everyone around him after the last time this happened and there was a massive confrontation. Blackthorn's actual meeting with Toranaga is interesting for sure. First off, Mura reveals to Blackthorn that, yes, he is indeed a samurai who has been embedded into Anjiro. He then goes to help Blackthorn converse with Toranaga, translating some words here and there. Blackthorn apologizes for his outburst, back during the surrender to Toranaga's brother, Nobutatsu. He then goes on to ask Toranaga to spare the people of Anjiro, to which Toranaga is surprised that Blackthorn does not want to carry on his war against the Catholics anymore, being that Blackthorn had been told earlier that the destruction of his ship was a Christian doing. And we can see here that Blackthorn is really just done with the whole thing and does not care to fight on anymore. Toranaga refuses, however, prompting Blackthorn to have an outburst where he tells Toranaga that he had come there all along just to use Toranaga, that Blackthorn was the real enemy. I don't necessarily understand what he means by this. He said he fed Toranaga lies, but I don't really know what he means or where he would have done this. You can make the argument that Blackthorn was for sure just using Toranaga in his own fight against his European enemies, but I'm not sure what he meant here by calling himself the enemy. If you get what was going on here, I'd love to hear someone explain this in the comments section. Anyways, it's then that we finally get Blackthorn's seppuku scene, as he would rather die than let Anjiro continue to suffer. I've talked about this detail, or the lack thereof, a lot, because it is certainly a massive element from the book which has been so far absent from the series. And it's here, right as he is about to stab himself, Toranaga swoops in to stop him, and tells him that he should rebuild his ship, for Toranaga. We then go on to see that the persecution also comes to an end. Now, while I am glad that we finally got Blackthorn's seppuku attempt, I still am upset that we did not get it sooner, and that it did not play nearly as large a role as it did in the prior versions of the story. Following this, we move on to Yabu's final conversation with Toranaga before his death, and it is here he finally reveals the whole plan to him, and more so to us, the audience. Yabu, just like Blackthorn, Mariko, and so many others, were just tools to be used by Toranaga. Crimson Sky has already happened. It was Mariko, after all. Toranaga knew he could not send an army to Osaka and win, so instead he sent Mariko, and through her death, he will achieve his great victory. While, yes, this is similar to what happens in the book, the book also relies way more on Toranaga actually acting sensibly and realistically, too. In the book, he actually tells his generals of the plan, so important figures like Hiromatsu don't have to die. And also, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think Ochiba's turn against Ishida was really that important of a detail in the book. In fact, I'm struggling to remember if she even did turn against Ishido in the book, so if those details are fresh in your memory, please let me know in the comments below. Obviously, in the book, Ochiba and Mariko did not grow up as best friends, so Mariko's death would not have meant much to Ochiba, on top of the fact that she also hated Toranaga because Toranaga might be the only person who knows that Ochiba's son, the child of the Taiko, may in fact not be the Taiko's real son at all. Throughout the book, a bigger emphasis is placed on Toranaga winning over the Christian daimyo to his side, something which comes to play a larger role by the end with Mariko's death and the destruction of Blackthorn's ship. This means that their treachery is going to be more plausible at the actual Battle of Sekigahara, a battle in which the real Tokugawa Ieyasu largely won thanks to those who betrayed the Western army to join him. 
But the idea of Toranaga banking everything on Ochiba turning to his side is quite the gamble, one which I don't think that Toranaga from the book or the real Tokugawa Ieyasu would have necessarily taken. Ochiba, if she would have put more thought into it, could have just as easily still sent the armies of the air to join in the fight on Ishido's side anyway. Because it all honestly just makes Ochiba out to be the biggest loser of the series, as not only is she losing control of everything here by not supporting Ishido, but she is also unknowingly dooming her son 15 years from now, when Toranaga is going to inevitably come and destroy him at the Siege of Osaka. I mean, she has to know that Toranaga is going to take over, right? And then she has to suspect that Toranaga is going to eventually want to rid himself of her son, right? It just does not make enough sense for me that she would not support Ishido. Despite how sad she might be that Mariko died. If anything, the main lesson here that can be learned by not only Ochiba, but perhaps every single character, is that Toranaga is not someone to be trusted. Ever. But getting back to Toranaga and Yabu. Yabu honorably commits seppuku, knowing he served a greater purpose. That Toranaga's victory is in large thanks to his own actions. And because of him, the way is paved for Toranaga to accomplish his true goal of becoming Shogun. Something he says he will achieve after he wins the Battle of Sekigahara, which somehow he already knows will be fought at Sekigahara. I imagine by this point that Toranaga can just see into the future or something and know everything that's going to happen. And as many of us already suspected or flat out knew, no, there was no Battle of Sekigahara shown. Just two armies squaring up in the hypothetical situation that Toranaga explains to Yabu. First off, let's ask the important question. Did we actually need to see the Battle of Sekigahara? And I have to think it depends on which version of the story we are experiencing. In the book, which glosses over the battle, no, I honestly don't think we needed too much, and what was covered there was certainly enough. For the 1980 version, I definitely think they could have had a little bit more, but for this show, it does feel like an aspect that was massively missing for one simple reason. The time they invested into each character. In the book and 1980 adaptation, Blackthorn is really the main character, so there is a reason why the battle would not be really featured. It's not really part of his story. Here in this 2024 adaptation, however, they really have put a ton of time and effort into showing more of each character. Blackthorn is not the central figure here, but instead one of many characters. Characters like Ishido and the other council members, not to mention Buntaro and even Hiromatsu and Nagakaro before they decided to kill them off. More time with these characters meant more investment, more of wanting to see how their stories play out. And while Blackthorn's story did not really center on the Battle of Sekigahara, every other character's pretty much did. So not seeing it does feel like a massive letdown. And I can already see comments coming in from people who were expecting it, only to not get it at all. Because then, without the battle, there are very few action sequences. I'm not saying we needed tons of action for the story, but being a story involving samurai, I think many people are expecting it. And they are expecting war and battle because why wouldn't they? Especially with the way the story has been told, with everything building up to this battle. I will probably have more to say about this in my full review, but it will certainly be interesting to watch opinions roll in regarding the lack of the battle. I've already seen a number of comments on Reddit and on Discord of people being pretty disappointed. Now, there is not too much more I have to say for this one, besides that I did like Buntaro's final scene with Blackthorn. I'm glad they ended things on a positive note for them, being that in the book, Buntaro by the end still wants to kill Blackthorn, so this is a pleasant change I think. It's clear that Blackthorn ends his journey with us intent on rebuilding his ship, as he does in all prior versions. I didn't expect them to go that route with him based on all the changes they made to his story. So it is a little bit odd that they ended things right in the exact same spot they did despite all the differences. Maybe in this universe he does end up building the ship, and does end up leaving Japan, and the scene of him as an old man does come out to be true. Whatever the case, Blackthorn's fate was never truly his own, as Toranaga stands off watching him, destined to one day become Shogun. So, did the show ultimately stick the landing? At this very moment, if I had to make a snap decision, I would say no. I don't think the show managed to pull off what it was trying to achieve all said and done. But that does not mean it was bad either. I'm still thinking about it, and will have more of a rounded opinion of it all when I do my full series review. So perhaps my thoughts will eventually change on certain things. I just need more time to let it all soak in. 
One thing I can say though, despite my current disappointment, was that it was still a very fun ride, and something I did look forward to every week. If nothing else, it has been an awesome and enjoyable time to not only be a fan of Japanese history, but to also be a Japanese history content creator. So, I hope you all stick with me for when I come back soon to do my full series review. But with that said, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it all. What did you think of this episode? Did you like it? Did you dislike it? Do you agree or disagree with anything I said here? Please let me know in the comments below. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring that notification bell if you enjoyed this video and found it to be most interesting.